and it's being recorded about workshop one, so it's a good thing that you're. First of all, any, so any workshop, anything that you submit, you can submit multiple times. There is no problem, as long as it's not spamming, which means if you submit it and you're satisfied, and it said it submitted, if you submit three times, you lose mark, okay? If I see you submitted four times something and they're all identical, it's spamming. You're going to lose mark for spamming. But if you submit and you say, oh, I could have done it better, and it's still, dude, I have still time. You change it, you do another submission. And in your reflect.txt, in your sources.txt, you explain, this is, I made it better like this and that. If that's the case, no problem. Do 50 submissions and I don't care. As long as every single time you're making it better. Having said that, when you are creating a module, you should always think about reusability. You are going to reuse it. When I look at the, like when I start, when I actually designed this thing, I was thinking to have five functions in each module. But when I was finished, I saw the only function that can go in tools is only one function actually, and nothing else. One function that stood by itself as a tool and was not related to Word. All the other functions were actually Word functions. So my tools.h had only one function in it. And the rest are all in the other one. That was my, my understanding of it. Why? Because when you write, create a module called tools, you should be able to take that module and take it to another assignment and be able to use it without any dependencies. Tools are things that you can take with you to any problem and start fixing it, right? Now, next assignment, maybe you add something more to your tools. And you keep adding to them. You keep adding and adding and adding. And I'll try to have this file, tools.cpp and tools.h, added to every single workshop and assignment that you are doing. So if you have something custom made and you want to use, you have a chance to use it. And if your tools.cpp is empty, just let it be empty. Who cares? It's an empty file that is being compiled with no problem. So, and if you follow the rules, that's it. And another thing that I have to tell you, the rules of including, when do you know you have to include something? The only rule for including a file uh, in, inside your file, any type of file, either header file or CPP file, is to see if that header file is needed for that file that you're including into. So if, say, your tools.h is, if your tools.cpp is not using any word, you don't include word.h over there. If your word.cpp is not using any tool, you don't include it. If it uses anything, you do include it. Header files are the same. If your header file is not using any of the other header file, you don't include it in there. If it does, you do. The same thing stands for anything else. If you are using a string header, string, uh, header file function, then you include it. So if you have any extra includes and you already submitted it, go double check, remove them. You're going to lose mark on those. Yes. It, that's, that's one of the parts that I like being blindly following the rule, which means in that file, take a look. Anything is being used over there that needs a header file, include it. Don't think that, oh, I already included that in the header file, so I don't need to include, so I'm not going to do it. Why? Because in, now you can remember, in future, your programs are going to be, what, 150,000 lines of code. You won't be able to remember if you included this file somewhere or not. We have the safeguards in the header file just for that. So if you see in this file something from a header file is used, blindly include the header file. Don't worry. If it's already included, the safeguard's going to take care of it. OK? And it makes your code more readable. All right? That's the end of workshop one. 
Go look at the Senate graph again. Do it yourself by tomorrow night and you'll be fine. Okay? And now, I want your attention on this. It's extremely important. A quick review of pointers. And I have half an hour to do all this. It's all your fault. Anyways, so um, a quick review of pointers. A pointer is nothing but a type. A pointer is nothing but a type. OK? Let me clear that thing up. I'm going to pause the. <clears throat> Pointers are only a type, like integer, like double. Don't give it extra credit. And a pointer is not a type that is made up of another type. People think that if I say integer pointer, it's a type that I made out of an integer. That's not the case. A pointer is a type of its own. If I have an integer value, OK, and I want to create a pointer to it, I should think of a pointer, integer pointer like this. Or int ptr ptr. Got it? I have to think of integer pointer of an independent type of its own. The type is integer pointer. The variable name is PTR. Now, it happens that pointers in C language are created by adding an asterisk beside the type they are supposed to pointing at, they're supposed to be pointing at. And that's how it works. So this, the asterisk belongs to the type, not the variable. This is wrong. That is wrong. You are not creating an integer star PTR. You are creating an integer, integer pointer PTR. And if I hear you say integer star or integer asterisk, I'll kill you. The name of that thing over there is pointer. Name it right so you learn it right. Integer pointer PTR. That's what it is. Are we OK with that? Now, in previous session, we had a student. Remember? A class student. Remember that? So if I have a class student somewhere, a pointer to a student will be student pointer SPTR, let's call it. So I have an SPTR variable whose job is to point to any variable of type student. Are we OK with this? Are we OK with this? Now, I have a question. If you want to send, you have two Christmas cards that you want to send, and you put it in an envelope. Two identical Christmas cards, you put it in two envelopes. One is going to a house. The other one goes to an apartment building that is 5,000 times bigger than a house. Do you have to send a bigger envelope over there, or the sizes are the same? They are the same, right? The address of the place doesn't care if the place is bigger or not. Are we OK with that? That's why pointers are all the same size. A pointer to a character, to a pointer to a car, to a pointing to a double, to a pointer to a long, long, they are all the same size. They are all four bytes. They are all size of one unsigned integer value, because that's essentially what an address is. An address in the memory is the sequence number of the byte in memory. So if you have 8 gigs of RAM, your address starts from 0 up to 8 gigs. If you have 2 gigs of RAM, your address starts from 0 up to 2 gigs. It's an array of bytes in memory that you count. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and you keep going. Are we clear on this? 
Are we okay on this? All right. So that's what pointers are. So don't give pointers extra credit. Pointers are pointers. Um, let me get the rest of the student in here just for the heck of it so I can... Oh, I didn't do... Uh, I did? Okay, good. So it actually works. Okay. So I'm just going to put the student thingy over there. So now if I actually create a student, student S, um, and I'm going to set... And I'm going to say set... Um, Fred, and the other one is age 20. Okay, so if I do something like this, I can now say s.set. What am I doing? s.set. So I'm setting Fred to, setting student to be Fred in 20. Now I can actually say sptr can hold, can hold the address of s. Not ampersand s, address of s. Okay? Address of S. And now, if I want to access that S, that student, I can either say S.print to print the student, right? Or I can say SPTR that points to print. STPR, SPTR that points to print. This is potatoes, and this is potatoes, okay? Same thing. It doesn't make any difference. Either call its name. What's your name, dear? So either I say Mahsa, or I'm going to say third student in a row. It doesn't make any difference. Address of her or her name. Are we clear on that? So either use the name or use the address. Now, if I want to actually do that for an integer, I can actually say over here, in, so I can say actually, uh, let's say that val thing, I can say PTR holds the address of val, therefore, I can access, so that was with a structure, with a structure I'm using arrow, okay, because when you are having a pointer to a structure, you are not pointing to one thing. You are pointing to a package of five things. So you need to show which one you are dealing with. But when you are dealing with a single entity, the story is different. The address is the thing. If I say this row of students, I have to tell them which one. But if it's a single student, is this lady. I don't need to have an arrow for it. So that's why we have the arrow notation. Arrow notation is only used for structures and classes. Now, in here, I'm going to say what? I'm going to say target of PTR is set to 25. Now I'm going to say C out val. OK? Are we okay with this? So, essentially I said I am giving the marker to the third student in the row. Can you hold it please? Who has the marker? Her name, Massa? Massa. Got it? So either, so I gave using the address, but the person has it. It's the exact same thing over here. Are we clear on this? And that has lots of good side effects. Usually when you pass contents to a function, we did that in IPC 144. You put the value and the value is passed. You have no access to the, to the thing that you were receiving in the function. But now we can pass pointers to a function. Therefore, I am passing the address of the thing to a function instead of the value of the function. So I can fiddle with stuff. I can manipulate stuff remotely from a function because I have their address in memory now. That's what we did in IPC 144. Another thing that I have to quickly mention to you, because, um, yeah, 
So that's uh, 0, 1 PTR. Is, I don't know why they have this bug. As soon as you save something new, it, it throws an exception in, C, in the compiler. Anyways, let's get rid of these. We don't need that. I'm going to pause. All right. <laughs> One more time to review. So in C++, when you create a function, the functions are recognized by their name and the arguments passed to them. So the name of the function in here will be bar int char, and the name of the function will be here bar int. Therefore, using the type of the parameters passing to a function, C++ can recognize which one to call. In this case, bar int char is called, bar int char. So the function at line 4 or function at line 15 will be called. In here, I'm saying bar int only. And because I'm saying bar int only, the one that only has an int that is line 5 or 12 will be called. So if I walk through this, I press F10, by the way. It goes and puts the thing right at the first line. Now I'm going to put this, stick it at left, and I'm going to take the output at right. Now I'm going to walk through it. So I'm pressing F10. Now I'm pressing F11. It goes inside the function. So as you see, it jumps to this function. Len becomes 10. Fill becomes asterisk. And then it goes in here and runs it. I want to get out of it. It comes out over here. Now, second one, I know it's going to work. I'm just going to press F10 and jump over it, and that's 20. But when this one is called, because it's only one integer, it's going to go to the function that is one integer. And guess what? I am passing the second one. I am calling the second one to run it in a different way. Now, I have the same action bar working in two different ways, correct? What is it called in C++? Polymorphism. Okay, that's one of the aspects of C++. Overloading is part of polymorphism. But remember, this I call fake polymorphism. I'll tell you at the end of the semester. Why do we call it fake polymorphism? Because the name of the functions in eyes of you and me are bar. For compiler, there are actually two different names. <laughs> one is barint char and the other was barint. So they are not the same. They are two different functions. But we see it as the same. So these two, this, is, this is C++ faking polymorphism. <laughs> but it is still called polymorphism. It's called ad hoc polymorphism. OK? Remember that. All right? Well, at the end of the semester, we're going to go through all this. So that's one thing. So that's one. And the next thing would be, so uh, 0, 2. That's overloading a function, called function overloading, a function that is different with types only. But C++ has a very cool feature. That cool feature is called default value for arguments, which means if you take a look at this bar, what is the difference between bar with one argument and bar with two arguments? Bar with one argument passes dash, correct? That's all it does. So you can just remove this because it's something that is silly. And you can simply tell to the compiler, hey, if they didn't provide the second value, just put a dash for it. Ta-da. So what happens right now, line number four represents two functions, a function that calls with an integer and a character. And the second function is only with an integer. If they only provide the integer, because it has a default value for the second one, then it's going to actually use that value. So I can actually expand it. I want to say, when they only say bar, they want to have a separator, a long separator. So I'm going to say, 
if they only say bar, I'm going to print 70 characters. Now they can do this. So I'm calling bar in three different ways. The first one is 10 and asterisk. They are both provided. And because they are both provided, and because they are both provided, oh, where did you go? Sorry, I didn't mean that. I meant this. Well, not even that one. OK, let me just bring it over here. All right. All right, because they are both provided, it goes up here. And length will be 10, and fill will be fill will be asterisk, right? And it's going to call it. I don't want to go through it. Shift F11 gets out of the function. Boom. So that's, that's created, right? For the second one, the first value is provided. That is 30, right? So when I go to it, the first value is 30. The second one is not provided. Therefore, it will be dashes, correct? Shift F11, dashes, right? And the third one over here, And the third one over here, none of them are provided. So when I go over here, the first one will be 70, and the second one will be dashes. Therefore, if I run it, I'm going to have that. OK? This is called default value for the arguments. And obviously, you cannot, it is impossible to have what stops? It's Shift F5. OK, I should remember that. Shift F5. There you go. So what, what I need to remember is that I cannot do something like this. It just doesn't make sense. You cannot provide a default value for the first argument and not for the second one. Because arguments can be omitted from right side. Therefore, you can, you can add from right and go to left, but not left to right. That's obvious. All right, and we are done. That's overloading. Are we OK with this? Problem? Questions? Suggestions? And the last thing that I want to talk about and is the most important one. When you create an array, what happens? When you write integer a5, what happens? How many integers, how many, how many things are created? How many things are created? Five elements. Five elements. Five integers are created. That's what we've been taught in IPC 144, right? But that's not reality. What happens when you actually create a variable when you write integer a5 would be something like this, in fact. It creates a pointer of type integer. Then it puts five integers back to back and puts the address of the first one into that one. So essentially, a is a pointer pointing to the beginning of five integers. To prove it to you, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put some values in here. So I'm going to say over here, 100, 200, 300, 400, and 500. OK? What is this? If I say c out, a0, what's going to get printed? What's going to get printed? Now I'm going to say C out target of A. And the outcome will be identical. You see that? So arrays are essentially pointers pointing to the beginning of series of things. That's why if I want to print this five integers, I can have a function like this. So I can say int, int array print, oh, awkward name, int, OK, print int array, 
In here, I can say, of course, I'm going to make it constant because I'm printing. I don't want to change anything. So I'm going to say constant integer pointer a. And in here, I'm going to say int size. So it is a pointer, right? And let's not call it a. Let's call it something. So I'm going to call it over here uh, a r r. Okay. And now in here, I can say for int i set to 0, i less than size, and i plus plus. And i plus plus. And I can say c out uh, a r r i, and a space after, and then go new line. OK? So now in here, I can say uh, print integer array. And in here, I'm going to say a, and I'm going to say 5. And all it's going to do will be printing those things for me. Oh, built error. Why? No, what did I do wrong? Must return a value. Why did I put it int? Anybody can tell me? Void. Oops. OK? And if I do it, it's just going to print those things. So it doesn't make any difference. If I did it like this, essentially I'm saying ARR is an array who doesn't have a body. Remember that picture that I just showed you? If you have an array, remove the body. What remains? A pointer. <laughs> right? So that essentially means pointer. <laughs> no difference. Array without a body is only a pointer. So this is really potatoes and potatoes. It's the same thing as this one. Are we OK with this? Are we OK one? Are we OK two? We're OK? All right. Zero, three, what arrays, what? Arrays R dot CPP. That's not a C plus plus thing. That's a C thing. It has nothing to do with C plus plus. Okay. Now, a simple program to write. I want to ask you to write me a single program. The program is this. Receive series of integers from user. Ask for series of integers from user, print them, and their sum. Can anybody solve this problem? I want you to get few integers from the user, add them all up, print all the integers and their sum. So they put 1, 2, 3, 4. Then you've got to type 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 equals to, you add the sum up. Can you write this program? Can you? No, no, not, not your capabilities, but really, can you? No, you can't, because you don't know how many integers. I have to tell you five integers, maximum of 10 integers. The first question that you should ask me as an IPC student that no one asked is that proves to, to you guys that you need to work on your programming skills is that you have, to, you have to tell me maximum of how many numbers, because I have to create an array, right? If I just wanted the sum, you didn't need an array. You would put in a variable, and you would just accumulate everything and show the sum. But I asked you to print the numbers and their sum. So you need to reprint everything for me. So you need to keep it somewhere, so you need an array. And because I told you few numbers, you don't know how many numbers. You need to have a size for it, correct? You need to, you need to put 20. And then ask the, the, the user how many you want to enter. When user says 25, you're going to say, sorry, 25 is too much. I can only do 20, because that's my program is. And that's what really sucks. I don't need to do that. I want to be able to allocate memory, make the array as big as user wants to. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to say to user, uh,
Okay, uh, enter the number of integers. And we are assuming that user is the same person, that it never happens, right? So it's not a, like when I say the user says 10, we are hoping that user is going to put 10, not T E N, okay? All right? So that, that, that never happens, okay? We have to write a foolproof one. We're going to learn how to do it. But, but for now, let's assume that's the case. And then I need to get a size. So I'm going to say over here, I'm going to say integer. Uh, size. So that's the number of integers that I want. So I'm going to say C out size. Good. I received it. Now, now I need to have an array to that size. I can't do that. An array, you have to decide it at compile time. You have to write over here int nums and put a thousand because you're hoping user is not going to enter anything more than a thousand. But your assignment right now tells you that the one that you're doing with number of words that are coming up and you're reading fox and socks thingy, right? With that, when you're looking at that, you'll see that they can simply redirect the file. They can put a million integers if they want to. Then what are we going to do? The answer is this. Instead of writing something like that, because we know an array is just the pointer, whoops, is just the pointer that points to the beginning of an array. I'm just going to create a pointer. And as soon as they give me the size, I simply going to say, hey, compiler, ask the operating system for size integers. Ta-da. What happened now is that I took over creating an array, took over the creation of an array by myself. The operating system, the compiler is not creating anymore. I am creating it. I am allocating memory to the size I want. This happens at runtime, not compile time. Remember the compilation thingy that I showed you. You compile the code, and when you compile the code, compiler puts the array inside the executable. You saw it. So this is actually what happened. So essentially, compiler does that for you, right? I don't want that. Now I'm doing this. So the size of my ex executable is going to shrink, actually, because now my array is not inside the executable. My executable is a little small little thing with a pointer. I simply say, hey, give me five integers. And it's going to give it to me from the free memory that you have in your computer that doesn't belong to any program, and that's called heap. That memory, we call it heap. So it gets it from there. And that's how we're going to deal with it. Now I can actually go over here and say, see out, enter. size, integers. And now I can go integer i, and I'm going to say for i set to 0, i less than size, and i plus plus, and get them one by one. So that's the beginning of dynamic memory allocation that, you're gonna, that we're going to start the next day you're coming in. Okay, now what I want you to do, unlike the other times, this time you are going to actually study these two fully, and you're going to have a quiz on it. So next day you are coming in, you're going to be asked questions on dynamic memory allocation that I did not teach. I'll do that quiz, and then I'm going to teach you. All right, I want you to first read it. Try to understand it. Then you come over here. I'll take care of it. All right? See you the next day you are coming in. Let me just put this on.